Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Cecci Galanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the education platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that I am hosting this educational activity today on cerebral amyloid angiopathy, ICH, and AFib stroke prevention approaches. We have exceptional speakers that will be sharing their expertise on the topic. Now, as per usual, before introducing today's moderators, today's speakers, our topics, we'll have a quick look at some of our housekeeping rules here on Zoom. We, of course, welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. The questions will be addressed in the end during the Q&A session. You can, of course, use the chat box anytime to say hi or to leave your, your comments or your feedback. I want you to know that this webinar is recorded and the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar. And it will also be uploaded on the World Stroke Academy site as well as our YouTube channel. And it will be shared on our social media channels as well. And lastly, I kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey at the end, which will pop up on your screen after the webinar to share your feedback with us. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's moderators, Professor Elis van Eten, stroke neurologist at the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and Professor Marco Passi, stroke neurologist at the University Hospital of Tours in France. Thank you both for being here with us today. And Marco, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure today to uh, co-chair uh, with my colleague, uh, Alice uh, Manette, and with a very interesting um, webinar. So um, I will just start framing a bit the clinical uh, problem. Um, so let's start because we know all that uh, hemorrhagic stroke, ICH, is uh, a devastating disease with a high short-term mortality rate that uh, leads to a severe disability among survivors. And furthermore, patients with moderate to, severe, moderate to mild disability will experience during uh, follow-up a long-term functional decline. And this can be mainly due to cerebrovascular and cardiovascular uh, disease. These uh, cardiovascular events can uh, be uh, divided in arterial events that are uh, much more common, and that can be a recurrent ICH, ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction, but also very feared by clinicians, but uh, much less frequent venous events such as deep venous thrombosis and uh, pulmonary embolism. A very uh, nice uh, recent paper that combined uh, two population-based study, one from Oxford and um, the other uh, from Edinburgh, clearly show and confirm that lower ICH is a major risk factor for recurrent ICH because patients with lower ICH have a three times higher risk of recurrent ICH compared with non-lower ICH. And they also clearly show that atrial fibrillation is um, a risk factor for future ischemic stroke, and patients with atrial fibrillation will have a, a eight times higher risk for a future ischemic stroke. But, we can also use blood sensitive sequences to evaluate the underlying microangiopathy. For example, patients with a deep ICH and a deep microbiome will likely show arteriosclerosis, or also we can call it uh, hypertensive small vessel disease. Conversely, patients with strictly lower ICH, CMBs, or cortical superficial sclerosis, or also convex cell subarachnoid hemorrhage will likely show CA, according also uh, with the modified Boston criteria. But we also have patients that we can call mixed ICH, 
that show concomitantly lobar and deep bleeds. And this patient can either show advanced, advanced hypertensive small vessel disease or also CA. But as you can see in this graph, CA are the patient that are higher risk of recurrence after NICH. But we can also use single MRI marker to uh, stratify stroke risk after ICH. For example, cerebral microbits also in non-ICH population has shown to be associated with a higher intracranial hemorrhagic risk. But maybe there are a more promising marker for a future ischemic stroke. But for sure, the um, marker that uh, had been shown to be associated with the higher uh, risk of future ICH is cortical superficial siderosis. Because patients with siderosis in one sulcus have a two or two sulcus or two sul size have a two times higher risk for future ICH, while patients with disseminated cortical superficial siderosis can have up to a four times higher risk for future ICH. I will finish presenting also non hemorrhagic MRI markers. At this stage, this uh, have a role predominantly in the evaluation of the underlying small vessel disease and also in the evaluation of the total SVD burden. For example, white matter hyperintensities, when they show a multiple subcortical spots or also CSO APVS, have been associated to cerebral amyloid angiopathy and will be incorporated in the future Boston criteria 2.0. While deep lacunes, uh, basal ganglia in large perivascular spaces, and also what matter hyper hyperintensities with a peribasal ganglia pattern have been mostly associated with arterial sclerosis. So with this slide, uh, I have finished this uh, very brief background. And so now, uh, Alice, uh, you can present our uh, first uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Marco. The next presentation is about restarting oral anticoagulation after intracerebral hemorrhage, and is presented by Dr. Ashkan Shamanesh, Associate, Associate Professor of Neurology, and Martha and Owen Boris Chair in Stroke Research and Care at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Well, thanks very much, Alice, um, and thanks very much to WSA for the kind invitation to present on a topic um, that's quite challenging, but an Unfortunately, an active area research will hopefully will have much better answers to in the near future. Uh, I do have some relevant disclosures and I work with various companies that develop direct acting oral anticoagulants and I'm also the PI of the Enrich AF trial, which is an investigative initiated study funded by the AG Sanko. So our objectives today are to one, discuss the clinical dilemma of optimal stroke prevention in ICH survivors with AFib with a focus on cerebral amyloid angiopathy review emerging evidence on the topic, and then highlight ongoing randomized trials. And, and briefly, I'll mention my current practice in the absence of good evidence. Um, so AFib, as we know, is, is, a, is the leading cause of cardioembolic stroke, uh, which accounts for about a third of all ischemic stroke subtypes. And the clots that form predominantly in the left atrial appendage, but not, not necessarily all of them. There's also clots that form in the left atrium in this condition, uh, tend to be large ones that block proximal cerebral vessels that result in large territorial infarcts that have the highest rate of death and long-term disability amongst all ischemic stroke subtypes. Uh, fortunately, we have very effective medications at preventing these devastating ischemic strokes. And historically, that was anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonists or warfarin that provide uh, roughly a 64% risk reduction in all stroke relative to um, no an antithrombotic therapy. For the outcome of ischemic stroke in isolation, it's greater, about 67 to 70% risk reduction. And now we're in the era of direct acting oral anticoagulants, which provide um, another roughly 20% risk reduction in all stroke relative to VKA. And that's being driven largely by having a hemorrhagic stroke, which of course is the kind of most feared complication of anticoagulation in patients with AF. 
And, and it becomes particularly challenging when someone has already had an intracerebral hemorrhage because deciding whether to reinitiate them on anticoagulant therapy, you'll have to weigh the known benefits of these drugs in reducing these large devastating territorial ischemic strokes um, against the potential for them to have a higher risk of a recurrent ICH, but also larger bleeds that then result in greater death and disability if they were on an anticoagulant. Conversely, we also know that the breakthrough stroke, so not only do you get a 67% reduction in ischemic stroke, but the breakthrough infarcts that occur on anticoagulation tend to be less disabling, um, and all these competing factors need to be weighed. And as um, patients with um, prior ICH were excluded from all the pivotal randomized trials um, that looked at the benefit of anticoagulation in patients with AF, we, we, we don't have any firm evidence at this point. There's a lot of uh, kind of variability in practice. Um, I won't belabor this because Marco did a nice job summarizing the, the, the risk of ICH, but of course there's this dichotomy between non-lober and lober ICH, the, the latter being the more high risk group, which has a whole is about a 5% annualized rate of recurrence. And then that could be split. Well, not all patients with lower ICH have CAA. There is a proportion to have underlying hypertensive arteriopathy to have lower ICH. If you had to look at those that have MRI markers of CAA is about 7% per year. And then they can then be split into those that have disseminated siderosis or not. If they don't, they're about 5% per year. If they do, they're about 13% per year. And, and really what um, uh, Andreas is gonna go take us through is what extent does this uh, kind of percent need to be increased to offset the benefit of reduction in ischemic stroke? And we just don't know yet what that answer is, but we kind of have an idea of what, what the kind of estimates would be. Um, and current guidelines due to the absence of RCTs can't uh, kind of provide any firm recommendations. The ESO in 2014 guidelines essentially say just that. We don't have RCTs, we can't provide recommendations. Uh, the Canadian Stroke Best Practice recommendations and the most recently published AHA ICH uh, guidelines uh, provide some uh, kind of guidance in the absence of firm evidence uh, and really just make the case that it needs to be individualized, uh, weighing the risk of bleeding versus thromboembolism. Um, and in the Canadian guidelines, they also kind of reinforce uh, that DOAC should be preferred based on their favorable safety profile over warfarin in non-ICH uh, randomized trials if anticoagulation were to be resumed. Um, and that's in context of ACEF, of course, mechanical valves in that uh, setting. Um, and the kind of variability in practice is, is kind of depicted here in a survey that we conducted among stroke neurologists, neurosurgeons, and thrombosis experts. Uh, and we basically provided them with different kiss vignettes and asked them how likely are you to resume anticoagulation and then at which time, which I won't get into. Um, but uh, where patients or physicians rather felt most comfortable resuming anticoagulation was bleeding in the brain due to head trauma, where 98% would ultimately resume anticoagulation. Where they felt most reluctant was in patients with CAA, where one uh, or sorry, uh, one out of three stroke experts or neurosurgeons or thrombosis uh, specialists said that they would ultimately resume anticoagulation. And then those with lower hemorrhage, and this kind of shows that these are sophisticated enough respondents to recognize that not all, all lower ICH are CAA, 70% uh, felt comfortable resuming at some point in time. And this kind of is similar to a survey that was conducted at the International Stroke Conference in 2018. It was a debate by Stephen Meyer and Alessandro Briefi. Uh, and basically the question was posed to the audience, but whether anticoagulation, uh, actually the statement is anticoagulation therapy should not be restarted in patients with anticoagulation related to low brain intracerebral hemorrhage. A third agreed with this statement, 70% almost or rather 60% said that they disagreed um, and that they would resume anticoagulation, lower ICH, uh, and 8% were undecided. We really didn't have any good observational data either on this topic until right 2015, when a few large um, national registries were published in Germany and Denmark. Um, and then um, it kind of in 2017, this is a uh, aggregate meta-analysis of these observational registries conducted by Santosh and Co Murthy and colleagues. And, and what they showed, interestingly, is that the observational data, when it's pooled, does replicate the effect size you would expect with anticoagulation versus no anticoagulation, about a 66% risk reduction in the outcome of ischemic stroke in the left figure. What is surprising is that on the in the right figure is that um, there, these registries do not suggest any increase in risk of ICH with resuming anticoagulation. And this is particularly su surprising because the, over 90% of these cohorts, the anticoagulation being used was vitamin K antagonist warfarin and not the safer alternative of direct acting oral anticoagulants. Uh, and um, really, you could take this at face value and say, well, this is 
quite reassuring, and we should resume all patients with anticoagulation because you gain this large ischemic stroke benefit, no recurrence in ICH. But, but the reality is that this is observational data and likely confounded. And, and the most important confounding is confounding by indication, right? Physicians are choosing who's being anticoagulated, they're choosing who's not being anticoagulated, and they're likely choosing higher risk patients not to be anticoagulated. Those who have safer natural histories are being anticoagulated, and then you gain this artifact of safety that is not accurate. And this is why we really need, we need randomized trials. And one way, as you saw in our survey, that patients are being selected to anticoagulate or not anticoagulate is underlying CAA. And, and really, this is the only observational data I'm aware of that, that addresses this matter. Um, and this was published by Alessandro Bifi and colleagues in 2017. And it was an individual participant data meta-analysis of three cohorts, the MGH-ICH cohort, the German retrace uh, cohort, and then the uh, US kind of multi-center cohort called the ERIC project. And ultimately, they identified 1,000 patients with anticoagulant delayed ICH and AFib. Um, about um, 633 were non-low bar, about a third of whom resumed anticoagulation. 400 were low bar, about two. 3.3% resumed on anticoagulation, and the median time of resumption was somewhere between 35 and 44 days. And ultimately, when you look at the outcome of mortality, um, you, you're seeing an overall benefit irrespective of location with a 71% risk reduction in all-cause mortality in patients with lower ICH, a fourfold increase in favorable outcome in, or, for both uh, subtypes, 52% uh, risk reduction in ischemic stroke and lower ICH versus 61 in deep ICH, and then no difference again in recurrent ICH with a hazard ratio that's 1.2 for both. Uh, for lower ICH, that is slightly higher of 1.17 for non lower versus 1.26 uh, for low bar, but again, the confidence intervals are wide and they cross uh, the null. Um, so again, reassuring observational data for the lower ICH group. And then also they went on to look at patients who had strictly lower microglias or cortical superficial siderosis on their MRIs. This is a smaller sample of 200 individuals, but again, a robust 70% risk reduction in mortality in those who had probable CAA based on MRI findings and a threefold the greater likelihood of having a favorable outcome of MRI 0 to 3 um, if they were to res resume on coagulation. Again, very surprising because the majority of these patients were being resumed on vitamin K antagonist slash warfarin. So, um, and, but um, although this is a step further in terms of addressing the confounding indication seen in all ICH patients, it's still observational data and it still has the same limitations and it doesn't supplement the need for an RCT. But you can imagine it does start challenging the previous dogma we've had for several decades in the literature that patients with CAA should never be anticoagulated. I think that's gonna be, that's a, um, something that's being challenged more and more by evidence and people in clinical practice are getting more comfortable resuming um, anticoagulation in these patients. So what do I do in my practice? Well, I actually, to resume anticoagulation in all ICH patients, irrespective of their MRI findings, if they've only had one symptomatic ICH. Once they've had two symptomatic ICH, then I'll consider alternative therapies, and one of which is left atrial appendage closure that Karen will be speaking to us about. But, but what I ensure that I do before I start anyone in anticoagulation, and, and this is, I think, is, is, is pivotal, and one of the data points that's probably confounding all of our CAA data in terms of natural history is that John Rosen's group has shown that these patients tend to have less effective blood pressure control. So, so if we start controlling blood pressures better in CAA patients, we may actually see lower rates of recurrent ICH than we're currently seeing. Um, and uh, one thing that I do is that is basically I ensure all my patients use home blood pressure monitoring devices. They take the blood pressures two or three times a week alternating between evening and daytime on separate days. And I tell them, call me if more than one out of five sequential readings on separate days or is above 130 over 80, uh, at which point I'll call their pharmacy and adjust their medications as necessary. I've had good success in doing so. And this is a protocol that we mandated in a pilot trial in this population called NASPATH ICH. And we were able to get um, good blood pressure control across all participants uh, at different sites across Canada uh, using this method. Now. Just to give you a couple of examples of patients who are uh, in my patients that have been randomized in an ongoing open label and rich AF trial, um, who've had very severe MRI profiles. So this is someone who's got a lower ICH, multiple lower microbleeds, disseminated superficial siderosis, was randomized to a doxaban in November of 25 to 2019. They're getting every six months follow-up since then. They haven't had any recurrent strokes. This is another patient who's had three prior symptomatic lower ICH, 
Again, in my practice, I normally wouldn't anticoagulate this patient, but I did have equipoise to randomize them after they presented with a devastating ischemic stroke. Um, and uh, this was, which is the counter argument uh, or counter um, um, cerebrovascular event that, that makes us uncertain about what to do because these patients are really between a rock and a hard place. Um, and this patient was randomized to edoxaban in January 29th of 2020, has not had any recurrent events. This is another patient who presented with a transient focal neurological episode or a CAA uh, or an amyloid spell. Um, and they were randomized to doxaban in August of 2020, uh, almost two years now without any recurrent events and, and very severe disseminated siderosis on their MRI. So um, again, these are not patients that are gonna basically have immediate ruptures if their blood pressure is well controlled. This is, I guess, anecdotal. It's only a sample of patients, but, but the more of these patients getting entered into our ongoing randomized trials, the more likely we are to have a good uh, answer for these patients moving forward. Um, there have been three small pilot trials uh, that have been published to date, NASPAF ICH we did in Canada, SOSTAR in the UK, Apache AF in the Netherlands, a total of 334 participants with a median follow-up of one and a half years. The overall out outcome of any stroke, including ICH and ischemic stroke, seems to be reduced by about um, 40 percent. Uh, with anti resuming anticoagulation versus not, but you do not see consistent results. And that, for instance, in Apache AF, you actually had greater rates of, of all stroke versus no anticoagulation. So again, this is a very preliminary small samples and we need large phase three studies uh, to, to, to really answer the question. One point I wanna make, and, and kind of Marco did a nice job outlining this as well, is that in the largest study to date, so start, the rate of ischemic stroke off anticoagulation was enormous, 19% at one year. It's very similar to what we're seeing in observational data where um, the risk of ischemic stroke is ranging between 10 to 13% per year in this population off anticoagulation. And um, it, it may be that, uh, and, and this is despite a median CHAT score of about 2.5, right? So um, we wouldn't expect this based on their risk factors. So there is something intrinsic to this population that's resulting in bleeding and thrombosis. You can speculate whether, whether inflammation and excessive cytokines could do this, but, but that, that's pure speculation, we don't know. Now there was a twofold excess risk of recurrent ICH and so start. Here you're comparing um, at the control group, only 25% were receiving aspirin, 75% were receiving nothing. Uh, that needs to be factored into interpreting this data. But one thing that was concerning is that those who had recurrent ICHs on anticoagulation were more likely to have mortality. And this needs to be monitored closely in our phase three studies. Overall, when you do an aggregate meta-analysis of all these studies, you see about a 36% reduction in all stroke um, and a potential 30% increase in mortality. But again, conflicting results <clears throat> where you have less mortality in Apache AF and NASPAF, but greater mortality in SOSTART. So again, we don't know. Um, and then lastly, for lower ICH, this is an IPDMA that was uh, presented at um, EA stock by Rustam Al Shahi Saman, who's kind of a close colleague, and he provided me with a slide. But, but for their overall outcome of stroke or cardiovascular death in an in a IPDMA of, of Apache and SOSTART, um, there was no treatment interaction for having lower ICH at baseline. So it seems like the overall kind of 27% trend for reduction in this outcome was similar between patients with low bar and non low bar ICH. We're now doing a prospective IPDMA amongst several phase three studies and some phase two studies that are ongoing, the largest being the Enrich AF trial, which will hopefully have close to 1,200 participants randomized then. We're currently at about kind of 360 participants globally. This is a global study being conducted at 250 centers in 20 countries on five continents. We hope to have answers in 2024 for, for our community. If you see your country listed here and you have, you're not participating but are interested in doing so, please send me an email. So to conclude, the dilemma of anticoagulation therapy post-ICH is certain to increase with our aging demographics. Confounding by indication limits interpretation of current observational data and the result from pilot randomized trials have been conflicting. Uh, successful completion of ongoing main phase trials is essential for the ultimate optimization of care in this vulnerable population. And really these patients with CAA, if I'll steal a quote from Rustam El Shai Salman from Edinburgh, that, that they really deserve level A evidence to guide their practice. They need to be included in RCTs, continuing to do guesswork based on observational data sets does them a disservice. Um, so if you do have a trial available to you, randomize. If you don't, uh, Andreas is gonna kind of go through an algorithm with you that could help you in clinical practice. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Ashkan. Ashkan, um, I'm sure that this is raising some questions. Please uh, post them in the Q&A. We will address them at the end of uh, this session in the Q&A session. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Karen Fury, who is Chief of Neurology of the Rhode Island Hospital, Miriam Hospital, and the Bradley Hospital, and serves as a professor of, and chair of the Department of Neurology at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown. She will discuss left atrial appendage occlusion, the evidence and application in cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in today's um, uh, talk. Um, this is going to, to take off um, uh, and discuss a bit about an alternative to anticoagulation, uh, which is a mechanical occlusion of the left atrial appendage. So my disclosures. So the left atrial appendage, we just saw some images of it. It's the remnant of the embryonic left atrium. And on TEE studies, this, this uh, vestigial area is responsible for over 90% of the clots that form in the left atrium in patients with atrial fibrillation. The concept of trying to occlude the left atrial appendage has actually been around for a long time. Um, but initially, it was done during open cardiac surgeries for mitral valve procedures or maze, where the, uh, the, the cardiac tissue is scarred to prevent the propagation of atrial fibrillation. So as you can see here, this, this, the story really begins back in 1940s, uh, when William Dock had the idea of resecting the left at atrial appendage. Uh, in order to prevent clots from forming and, and causing stroke and systemic embolism. And then for many decades, this field didn't really progress very much um, until people began considering percutaneous approaches and the use of devices rather than open surgery to eliminate the, the risk um, produced by the left atrial appendage. And as you can see, there's been tremendous activity uh, in the last 20 years. I'm gonna to focus today on three pivotal trials in this area, uh, Protect AF, Prevail, and PROG-17. So those, those trials um, have all been done um, in the very recent past, um, and they really set the stage for people taking uh, the concept of uh, percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion seriously and thinking about indications where it might help reduce uh, hemorrhage risk. So currently there are numerous devices available, um, but most of them have only been studied in case series where feasibility and uh, practicality were demonstrated. Uh, the device that has the greatest amount of data is the Watchman device. And that's the one that I'll primarily focus on today. The Watchman device is the only one that's really been tested in randomized controlled trials. Um, and it's also, it happens to be the device that was approved by the FDA in the United States in 2015. And since the Watchman device was approved, uh, the company has actually developed a second iteration of this device uh, that was tested in a clinical trial. Um, and, and this now is, is probably going to be the more contemporary device used moving forward. The Watchman device, as you can see, has a mesh design um, and then this um, steel uh, structure that helps anchor it into the, the orifice that um, uh, introduces the left atrial appendage. And I have a diagram coming up of that. The numerous anchors are designed to prevent um, the device from shifting or embolizing. Um, and the intent is to try and minimize the amount of exposed metal to reduce the risk of thrombus formation on the device itself. And this cartoon demonstrates how these devices are implanted by a catheter um, into the left atrial appendage. And as you can see, it's the mesh side of that abuts the left atrium. Um, and then the steel part anchors it into the left atrial appendage, which presumably goes on to thrombose. So um, this is the, regardless of the device used, the, the, this is generally the, the approach that is uh, becoming the standard. So the first trial from 2009 
was PROTECT AF. Um, and this trial randomized over 700 patients who had atrial fibrillation and other high-risk features, TIA, stroke, congestive heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, or older age, over, over age 75. And it randomized them either to percutaneous closure with Watchman or to warfarin therapy. So you're gonna see this in several of the trials that I'm discussing, that warfarin is the comparator. And that's because when these were done, DOACs were not um, commonly available. This, the trials had not been published yet. Um, and so this does create a, a, a conundrum for clinicians now because it's using a suboptimal form of anticoagulation. And I'll come back to this topic. Patients who were treated with the Watchman device had warfarin for 45 days, then dual antiplatelet therapy for six months, and then aspirin alone. And I'll show you that there are various cocktails that have been used across these trials, and it's relevant to a high-risk population, such as patients with cerebral amyloid angiopathy, because subjecting patients um, with that disorder to anticoagulation, even for a relatively brief period of time, may subject them to risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. And I'll also note that the outcome for PROTECT AF and for this next trial was stroke, cardiovascular disease, and systemic embolism. And many of you will recall that all of the trials that used DOACs and compared them to warfarin had stroke or systemic embolism as the uh, primary outcome measure. So the inclusion of cardiovascular death or cardiovascular and unexplained death is a nuance that, that makes these trials different um, from the trials that established DOACs um, as the first line of therapy for patients with atrial fibrillation. So in these slides that shows the, uh, the, the outcome of the PROTECT AF trial, the control population receiving warfarin is in red and the intervention that received Watchman is in green. And as you can see for the primary efficacy endpoint, uh, the, the likelihood of having st uh, ischemic stroke, systemic embolism or cardiovascular death was lower in patients treated with the intervention. The risk of safety events was higher in patients who received the Watchman device. All stroke was reduced and all, all, cause, all cause mortality was reduced in patients who received the Watchman device. PROTECT AF looked at certain subgroups. And as you can see, for the most part, although many of these subgroup analyses were underpowered, um, depending upon the patient's age, sex, uh, chads to vasc score, uh, the pattern of atrial fibrillation and anatomic factors, um, all of these subgroups seem to favor intervention with Watchman compared to warfarin. But the, the safety events were not trivial. And as you can see, about 5% of patients who received the Watchman device developed a serious pericardial effusion. There were significant rates of major bleeding and one of the criticism of, of this study had to do with the high rate of bleeding in the warfarin treated patients. Obviously, if warfarin is not well managed, it, it's always going to um, appear to be high risk uh, compared to an intervention. And so this high risk of, of major bleeding in warfarin um, made the control arm appear um, uh, less uh, appealing than the intervention group. I'll also note that um, some of the patients did develop stroke as a consequence of undergoing the intervention. There were um, examples where there was device embolization. Again, this um, inflated rate of hemorrhagic stroke in patients treated with warfarin. Um, and so the concern about the safety events in PROTECT AF led the FDA to deny approval based on this single trial. And therefore, a second trial, the PREVAIL trial, uh, was designed in order to provide additional uh, confidence that one, the device was safe, uh, and two, that it would appear non-inferior to warfarin therapy. So the design of PREVAIL was to take patients, again, with high-risk atrial fibrillation, randomize them either to Watchman or to chronic warfarin therapy, um, after the watchman was implanted, all patients were treated with aspirin, 
they received warfarin for 45 days until the, or until the left atrial appendage was demonstrated to be closed on TEE, and then clopidogrel and aspirin for 45 days to six months, after which patients would remain on um, monotherapy aspirin. In contrast, the patients who received warfarin were going to remain on warfarin for life. The way this study was designed, there were two co-primary endpoints. And you can see here that on the summary of the trial, the, the one of the primary endpoints is subjugated here. Um, but it's important that non-inferiority of Watchman to warfarin was not achieved for overall efficacy, stroke, systemic embolism, or death, even though the rates were similar. So this trial actually failed to prove non-inferiority. There was a second co-primary outcome where they did prove uh, uh, non-inferiority, and that was for ischemic stroke or embolism more than seven days post-procedure. Um, and so when people think about this trial, they often forget that this was not a slam dunk for the Watchman device, that in fact, one of the co-primary endpoints was not met. But the PREVAIL trial did provide additional evidence that left atrial appendage closure was safe and could be considered an alternative. This trial also had a strange algorithm um, rather complicated for what to do with um, antithrombotic therapy after implantation. So they based decisions based on whether or not the left atrial appendage was successfully sealed off on the 45-day transesophageal echocardiogram. As you can see, if a seal was achieved, then patients could be switched to um, dual antiplatelet therapy and ultimately monotherapy with aspirin. In contrast, if there was not adequate seal of the left atrial appendage, then patients remained on warfarin and aspirin and then, uh, and then got switched to dual antiplatelet therapy. So um, this, this uh, introduced another variable which required the repeat transesophageal echocardiogram um, and also led to some independent decision-making on the part of the clinicians. Now, again, you can see for, as far as the, um, uh, the graph demonstrates the uh, event-free probabilities, that in fact, the risk of primary outcome was relatively low in both groups, the control group on warfarin in red and the device group in gray or blue. Um, but in fact, at 18 months, the ischemic stroke risk rate was higher in patients who received the Watchman device. And this is why non-inferiority was not met um, in the population of patients treated with the Watchman device. In terms of safety events in Prevail, the rates were actually lower than what, what was demonstrated um, in Protect AF. As you can see, still low rates of device embolization um, and other cardiac complications. And one of the reasons uh, that the authors put forth uh, for why non-inferiority was not achieved in PREVAIL um, was that the warfarin group actually overperformed um, compared to what was anticipated. And so in their um, main publication, they compared the, the rate uh, per patient years that was demonstrated in Arist Aristotle and Rocket AF, as well as RELY, these were all DOAC studies. Um, and as you can see, warfarin actually did better in the PREVAIL trial compared to these other DOAC trials. So in looking at these two um, seminal studies, uh, both of which looked at the Watchman device um, and uh, were reported um, at least um, in many circles as demonstrating non-inferiority, there are a couple of things to consider. The first is that the choice of non-inferiority non margin is very important in these trials. In RELY, the margin was 1.46. In Aristotle 1.44, the lower you set your non-inferiority margin, the more um, difficult it is to claim non-inferiority. In contrast to these DOAC trials, 
Protect AF used a non-inferiority margin of two and Prevail 1.75. So they designed trials that made it easier to declare non-inferiority of the device. They included cardiovascular and unexplained death in the, in the composite endpoints. And including these actually biases toward non-inferiority. The higher rates of hemorrhagic stroke in warfarin in patients with PROTECT AF was an anomaly. And again, as I've mentioned, PREVAIL did not meet statistical non-inferiority for the first primary endpoint. But of course, many of you are probably thinking, well, that's fine, but we don't use warfarin anymore. And so a more modern study, um, the um, PROG-17 study, actually compared the, uh, the, the uh, strategy of left atrial appendage occlusion to the use of DOAX. And it was flexible in terms of the device used and flexible in terms of the DOAC chosen. They chose a population of patients who had a CHADS CHADS-VAS score greater than three and a HAS-BLED score greater than two. So these were high-risk patients at risk both for embolic stroke, but also at risk for hemorrhage. And they followed them up on average of um, 20 months in this particular publication. This was the first report of uh, PROG-17. As you can see here, comparing left atrial appendage occlusion in red with DOAC uh, therapy in blue, this study did demonstrate non-inferiority. And as you can see, they were able to demonstrate uh, protection with the uh, intention to treat analysis and better performance following the per protocol and on treatment analysis. The antithrombotic therapy after left atrial appendage occlusion in PROG-17 had a couple of different possibilities. They recommended aspirin and clopidogrel for three months. But if a TTE then showed no device-related thrombus or leak of greater than or equal to five millimeters, the clopidogrel was stopped and aspirin was continued indefinitely. And they were able to adopt this um, safer, easier regimen uh, because of the ASAP trial that had been published in 2013 and demonstrated the feasibility of using dual antiplatelet therapy instead of warfarin in this post-closure period. For patients who are at high risk for bleeding, dual antiplatelet therapy was shortened to, two, to um, six weeks rather. And for patients who were at very high risk of clot formation, alternative regimens could include a DOAC substitution for dual antiplatelet therapy for up to three months or DOACs for six weeks followed by DAPT for six weeks. So this again gave clinicians some flexibility in how to manage patients in that immediate post-closure period. PROG-17 then published a longer follow-up of their patients with median follow-up of three and a half years. As you can see here, again, they were able to demonstrate non-inferiority for patients with left atrial appendage occlusion, uh, almost uh, identical rates of stroke or TIA, um, and lower rates of bleeding in patients who received uh, the left atrial appendage occluder. So let's look ju at just the, the numbers for these three trials that were spread out between 2009 and 2020. As you can see, the number of patients in the device arm is actually relatively small across all of these trials. Again, if you think about DOAC trials, um, there were tens of thousands of patients studied. In these trials, only a few hundred. Two of the trials used um, an obsolete therapy, um, warfarin. Only PROG-17 used DOAC. Um, there was variable follow-up across these trials um, and, and variable rates of outcomes using these devices over time. I think the most heartening message to take away from this slide is it appears that over time, with greater technical experience with these devices and with the percutaneous approach, you can see the rate of procedural complications is coming down significantly. Um, and this kind of sets up the, uh, the, the field for a contemporaneous study um, in well-trained proceduralists using um, the, the optimal anticoagulation strategy.
In addition to the trials that I've discussed, there's also a National Cardiovascular Data Registry, which has um, accumulated over 38,000 procedures across almost 500 hospitals in the US. The rates of leakage after a, uh, atrial appendage closure is, is quite low. Um, and the adverse event rates that are reported in the real world are lower than those in trials. So if you look at the formal recommendations by multiple um, countries, you can see that most of them come down uh, at a level 2B, um, mainly because of the lack of high quality randomized data. It's worth noting though, that all of these recommendations predate the publication um, of the PROG-17 study. And so it'll be interesting to see how these more recent trials that use DOACs um, may alter and perhaps strengthen these recommendations. There are multiple ongoing trials in this space. Many of them are comparing the various devices or using different combinations of antithrombotic therapy. So I think in, at least in the next decade, we should have um, a lot more information uh, about uh, the optimal device and perhaps um, the optimal strategy during the acute post-closure period, but also for long-term therapy. So in conclusion, left atrial appendage occlusion is a viable alternative to long-term anticoagulation for patients with atrial fibrillation and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. This approach has not been compared to no therapy because arguably patients with CAA would be unable to take any form of antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation. The combination of DOAC and aspirin has been used post-implantation in at least the most re recent um, uh, uh, Watchman trial, Pinnacle FLX. In addition, post-procedure dual antiplatelet therapy can be considered in lieu of oral anticoagulation in high-risk patients. And that approach has been tested in ASAP and PROG-17. Because of the absence of very strong data, patients and physicians have to engage in shared decision-making on the best option for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation when bleeding risk is high, such as in patients with suspected cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And it would be great in the future to be able to better quantify the actual risks and hemorrhage in a patient population undergoing left atrial appendage occlusion who have uh, possible or probable cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fury, for this very interesting topic. Uh, the last presentation will put it all together. Dr. Andreas Sharinibu is a postdoctoral clinical research fellow in neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Harvard Medical School. He will give us a pragmatic management approach uh, for CAA and AFib. We are trying to get his presentation on screen. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so my talk is going to be about um, basically putting together a pragmatic management algorithm when you have a patient with suspected amyloid angiopathy and uh, atrial fibrillation. So my outline is uh, basically suggest a clinical framework on how to approach this decision making for stroke prevention in CAA and AFib when recruitment to a randomized trial is not available. Uh, and we're going to just briefly touch on MRI phenotyping in amyloid angiopathy in relation to the bleeding risk. And these are mainly observational data, so they're heavily risk for bias. Uh, and as uh, uh, in previous presentations, we don't have good quality randomized evidence yet uh, for this particular population. So how it has been, um, how the treatment algorithm work in the fields for uh, decades is that you have a patient with suspected amyloid angiopathy, or in fact, any microbleeds uh, with uh, AFib. Uh, during the lack of evidence, uh, clinicians would do some sort of guesswork 
they will decide most of the time that the risk of ICH is overwhelmingly high. So they will either put these patients on aspirin or no treatment at all. And looking back, I think this uh, therapeutic nihilism was based on some prevailing myths in the field that we now know uh, there is more nuance into them. The first myth is that CAA causes intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, so what causes intracerebral hemorrhage is much more complicated. For example, an underlying bleeding prone arteriopathy like amyloid angiopathy or hypertensive arteriopathy can certainly lower the threshold for a bleeding. However, you have uh, precipitants and other vascular risk factors, for example, uncontrolled hypertension, alcohol use, antithrombotic use that will push these patients to uh, having a, um, a small uh, vessel uh, breakdown leading to a bleed. Also, as Dr. Schumann has mentioned, there was this prevailing myth that oral anticoagulation should never be used in a patient with amyloid angiopathy due to a, the extremely high risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, uh, and again, always uh, outweighing the benefit that these patients might get in reducing the stroke, the ischemic stroke risk. We now know what we're gonna see in, in the, uh, in the uh, later slides that we can quantify better the risk of bleeding in cerebral amyloid angiopathy now based on MRI. Also, another myth is that any microbleeds equal the presence of uh, CAA, which equals high risk of ICH. And we know that microbleeds uh, are also associated with risk of ischemic stroke uh, in patients with uh, small vessel disease. And uh, the microbleeds that indicate the presence of amyloid angiopathy are those that are strictly lower, not any microbleeds. So I agree with Dr. Schumann is that what these patients deserve is basically a more complicated algorithm, which is based on level A evidence from randomized controlled trials. And uh, this is gonna be possible uh, in the, hopefully the next uh, two to four years after we're gonna see the completion of all the ongoing trials that they were mentioned. And this will allow to stratify the risk of uh, hemorrhage better in these patients and also have more data on the safety and the risk benefit analysis of each available option. So what I'm gonna try to do here is uh, to give you a framework as a clinician on how to approach a patient with amyloid angiopathy when they have AFib until randomized data are available. And this is only when randomized patient into a trial at your center is not an option. So you basically need to answer four questions, do four estimations. The first one is to estimate the baseline ICH risk in amyloid angiopathy when the patient is uh, not on oral anticoagulation. The second question is to um, calculate the expected increase in this ICH risk when you do put patients on oral anticoagulants. The third question is to estimate the ischemic stroke risk in a patient with CA and AFib with no anticoagulation, and conversely, to calculate the expected reduction in this ischemic stroke risk when you choose a therapeutic approach. Using these four um, uh, questions and estimations, you can uh, establish the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage and the benefit of reducing ischemic stroke risk and individualize this for any given patient you have um, uh, at your clinic. So to answer the first question, the estimate baseline risk uh, of hemorrhage in CAA without anticoagulation. We now know much more about amyloid angiopathy. We know it's not a single disease entity, but it can present at least with four uh, presentations or, four, uh, or at four clinical settings. First, as you know, amyloid angiopathy can present with low bar cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and the risk of a recurrent hemorrhage in this population is between 7 to 10% per year. The second most common presentation are patients with the so-called amyloid spells or transient focal neurological episodes, which are typically associated with cortical superficial siderosis or convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage, and these patients have a very high risk of, uh, of bleeding uh, at a level of 13% per year. So these two presentations should be treated as equivalent when it comes to thinking about 
the bleeding risk in the future. The third setting that you might encounter CA is uh, at memory clinics when you have a patient with cognitive impairment, when the MRI shows, uh, MRI shows stigma of this uh, condition like lower micron bleeds and siderosis. Here from limited data, we know that the risk is pretty low. It's around 3% per year. And lastly, amyloid angiopathy in the majority of people who have this pathological condition is asymptomatic. Uh, and this is a setting where you see, for example, patients in the general population and also patients with uh, lower micron bleeds that got a brain MRI because of an ischemic stroke or TIA. In this setting, the risk of future hemorrhage is pretty low. For ischemic stroke or TIA, it's around 1%. Even when you have a large number of microbleeds, like more than 10, the risk is still pretty low. It's 2.7% per year. In the general population, this risk is often lower, is 0.3% per year. Now, just some basic pathology and pathophysiology, uh, these presentations really beg the question of what drives the risk of hemorrhage in amyloid angiopathy. And we know from neuropathological studies and genetic studies that uh, amyloid angiopathy has a neuropathological spectrum of severity. And what is really associated with the high risk of hemorrhage are the so-called CA-related vasculopathies. Uh, CA-related vasculopathies represent the most severe form of amyloid deposition uh, in the small uh, vessels of the brain to the extent that they have started damaging the vessel. For example, you can see here the so-called vessel within vessel appearance when the vessel is so fragile that when you put it on uh, for neuropathological preparation into the slides, it basically separates between its walls. You can also see here little cracks in the vessel wall. Also, the other uh, C-related vasculopathy is fibrinoid necrosis when the, uh, uh, the vessel wall is thickened and basically it's uh, necrotic uh, because of the underlying CA process. And we know that the C-related vasculopathies confirm the overall majority of the bleeding risk in patients with CAA. Now, the two prevailing symptomatic presentations uh, with lobar uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and amyloid spells essentially increase the chances of the patient having neuropathologically severe amyloid angiopathy. What is more important is that we have realized in the last five to 10 years that we have a very good marker of advanced amyloid angiopathy, and this is cortical superficial siderosis. This marker is identified on blood sensitive sequences, including SWI and T2 star GRE. And as you can see here, it leads to this curvy linear deposition of uh, blood breakdown products across uh, the uh, superficial layers of the brain. From neuropathological studies, who, uh, which correlated directly the imaging uh, manifestation of siderosis to the underlying neuropathology using ex vivo imaging, we know that uh, uh, siderosis essentially um, represents black, uh, blood breakdown products deposited into the uh, subarachnoid space. You can see here the blue areas, which is basically iron with Prussian blue stain. And in these areas with siderosis, we see the very severe forms of CAA. This is a large leptomeningeal vessels, which again has this uh, uh, vessel within vessel appearance due to advanced amyloid angiopathy deposition. So we have a good pathologically based uh, neuroimaging marker of advanced CAA, which makes sense because uh, initially from anecdotal evidence and then from large observational studies, it seems that the presence and uh, severity of siderosis, it's maybe the most important prognostic risk factor for future ICH in these patients with amyloid angiopathy. These are the results of a meta-analysis we did where we pulled together um, uh, data from six eligible studies, over 1,200 patients with possible or probable amyloid angiopathy that present with either TFNEs or lower ICH. We followed them up for around three years, and uh, the outcome event was uh, any new lobar intracerebral hemorrhage. And as you can see from the forest plot, the presence of siderosis doubles the risk of a future hemorrhage. Uh, 
if you have disseminated sclerosis into the brain in at least uh, three or more um, areas, then uh, the risk uh, for a future hemorrhage is more than four times higher compared to patients with no sclerosis. So really, we really believe now that sclerosis presence and extent is one of the most important, if not the most important MRI prognostic risk factor for future uh, ICH. Again, this is evidence from uh, observational studies, so it's class three. Um, we also know that in patients presenting without any lower hemorrhage, uh, but instead they present with uh, transient focal neurological episodes, when there is cirrhosis, uh, the risk of uh, a future first ever hemorrhage is also increased by a factor of four at least if you have uh, cortical superficial sclerosis. And what's important in this analysis, as in the meta-analysis, is that when you pull together into uh, multivariable uh, models, uh, the various imaging markers that uh, we traditionally believe they increase the risk of hemorrhage in CAA, like the presence of multiple lower microbleeds, this is no longer the case. So the presence of sclerosis outweighs the risk any risk confirmed by microbleeds in these models. In previous studies in CA that they showed that uh, increasing number of lower microbleeds increase the risk of hemorrhage in these patients, siderosis was not taken into account. So we now know that siderosis is probably the most important risk factors and for a recurrence or a first ever hemorrhage, uh, uh, whereas microbleeds are probably a good marker for the presence of amyloid angiopathy but not necessarily for the risk of future hemorrhage. We can also do some more deep phenotyping of the extent of siderosis in the brain uh, in relation to the future ICH risk. And you can see here the extent of siderosis compared to the future uh, ICH uh, range uh, in patients with CA. So no siderosis confers a risk of 3.9%. The presence of siderosis confers a risk of around 11% per year. Focal siderosis is around that range, but disseminated siderosis increases the risk up to 12.5% per year, whereas more disseminated siderosis, meaning that essentially many areas of the brain are covered with uh, a siderosis deposition, the risk is, uh, could be up to 26.9% per year in these patients. So it's not just the clinical presentation of amyloid angiopathy that increases the risk of hemorrhage, but it's really the imaging presentation in relation to the degree of siderosis that drives this risk across the spectrum of CAA. Now, just a quick note about asymptomatic CAA uh, as evident by the presence of lower microbleeds in ischemic stroke or TIA. We now have good data from CROMI studies and other studies including this huge meta-analysis that was recently published, showing that although in uh, relative risk, so in hazard ratios, the presence of microbleeds do increase the risk of hemorrhage in these patients, the absolute rates of a future hemorrhage is, algo, is always lower than the risk of ischemic stroke in patients with microbleeds and in patients with probable amyloid angiopathy. Again, these are patients without any syndrome associated with amyloid angiopathy, but only as an incidental finding of uh, lower microbleeds. So moving on to the second question we have to answer when we approach these patients. What's the expected increase in ICH risk when you start uh, endoc, let's say, in a patient with uh, uh, AEF? So in unselected patients with AEF on DOAX, the ICH risk increase has an odd ratio of 1.33. And th these data are from uh, Cochrane database uh, reviews using uh, an umbrella methodology for their review and they're comparing DOACs to no anticoagulation. However, these uh, odds ratios might not apply to patients with CA or ICH. As Dr. Soman had mentioned, in the SOSTAR trial, the ICH risk increase in oral anticoagulation versus no oral anticoagulation in ICH had a hazard ratio of uh, 2.4. So the real question, the real answer is that we don't really know what's the expected increase in the ICH risk in these patients. And furthermore, we don't really know how the imaging uh, manifestations of amyloid angiopathy, 
uh, and I'm talking about again siderosis interacts with oral anticoagulation to further increase this risk. The third question is the, to estimate the ischemic stroke risk in AF without anticoagulation. And we all know that in unselected patients with AF, the ICH risk can be calculated with the CHAS-VAS score. So with a CHAS-VAS score 5, the risk is around 72% per year. However, in patients with uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, even with a median uh, CHAS-2 of 2.5, the risk of ischemic stroke when they have AF, it might be even higher at a range of 10 to 17% per year. The expected reduction in ischemic stroke with oral anticoagulation, again from Cochrane database reviews, has a pool odds ratio of 0 0.38. So the use of oral anticoagulation in AF reduced the risk of an ischemic stroke by 62 to 64%. Now, how do we put all of this together? Uh, let's take the hypothetical scenario. You have a patient with uh, AF, a CA-related lower hemorrhage with no siderosis on, uh, on MRI. So you want to calculate the risk of an ischemic event. Without DOAC, let's assume it's 10% uh, per year. Then the, uh, with the use of DOAC, the relative risk reduction is uh, with a factor of 0 0.38. So the risk of a future ischemic stroke when you start a dog is 3.8. You subtract this from the baseline ischemic stroke risk and you get the risk reduction rate at 6.2. Now let's move on to calculate the bleeding risk. Without a dog, a patient with a, a C-related ICH and no siderosis has a base risk of 4%. Let's assume that the risk, this risk increases by uh, 1.33 then the new risk of hemorrhage is 5.32, which uh, represents a risk, a hemorrhagic risk increased by a factor of 1.32 per year. So you have a net benefit in that you have, you're preventing more ischemic strokes than you are creating higher risk of hemorrhage. For the risk of hemorrhage to outweigh the benefit of uh, uh, preventing an ischemic stroke, the odds ratios or hazard ratios need to be 2.55. Now, using the same methodology, let's look at the hypothetical scenario of having a patient with AFib, CA-related ICH, and this time you have disseminated siderosis. The baseline risk of ischemic stroke, again, we're assuming is 10%. You start in DOAC and you get the risk reduction as before, 0 0.38. So the new risk is 3.8. You have a net uh, benefit of 6.2% per year. Now, given the disseminated siderosis, the baseline risk for a hemorrhage is 12.5, is quite high. And if we assume a hazard ratios from the source start of two, then these risks jumps up to 25% per year. So you have uh, a, an absolute risk increase of 12.5, which is, is double uh, from the risk reduction in ischemic stroke. And for this risk to outweigh the benefit, you need to have a hazard ratio of 1.5. So I assume a bit of higher hazard ratio. Let's take now a patient who has CA-related transient focal neurological episodes, no lower hemorrhage at baseline, but we know these patients have disseminated siderosis most of the time. I assumed a risk of ischemic stroke at 7.2% per year because I assume these patients will have a similar risk based on the CHAS score or with any unselected AF patient. Risk reduction leads us to a, a risk of, of uh, ischemic stroke of 2.7, absolute risk reduction 4.5% per year. Risk of uh, future hemorrhage at baseline is 13.2. Let's assume we increase this risk by a factor of two. Then you see that the new risk of hemorrhage is 26.4%, which again, it's an absolute risk increase of 13.2% and is more than three times the absolute risk reduction. And again, for um, the risk of hemorrhage increase to out with any benefit of anticoagulation, you need a hazard ratio of more than 1.3. Again, all of these calculations are basically guesswork because as, as it's becoming evident, we don't really know the numbers to those four questions. And importantly, we don't really know the increase of hemorrhage conferred by oral anticoagulation in the setting of, uh, of having CAA and in the setting of having imaging manifestations that confirm increased risk. That's why we need randomized trials to quantify this 
risks and any benefits, including sub-analysis uh, with MRIs. However, this approach does give us like a framework on how to think when you have a patient and randomized trialing is not an option. Uh, another thing is that we know that uh, CAA is not a static disease, it's dynamic and it's progressing. And we know that in patients with even focal siderosis, if you follow them up in the course of the next couple of years and you do follow up MRI, siderosis does progress because you can imagine you have very severe leptomeningeal amyloid angiopathy with occasional vessel cracks that lead to uh, blood extravasation into the subarachnoid space. And eventually if you have a lot of these small cracking events, one of them might not be concealed by the hemostatic system and it might lead to a lower hemorrhage. So if you have siderosis progression over the course of one or two years in two new areas uh, in the brain, then the risk of uh, a future lower interest over hemorrhage is, uh, uh, has a hazard ratio of 7.9. Again, in, this, in these models, the risk of uh, hemorrhage when you have new lower hemorrhage is not statistically significant. So I tried to put everything together on, uh, based again on what's my clinical practice. So you have a patient with suspected CAA, and I'm talking about a symptomatic CA presentation and uh, non-valvular AFib. You calculate a chats vas score, and ideally you need to do your risk assessment in the setting of a small vessel uh, uh, disease or a CA clinic. And if that's not available, you need close collaboration with a cardiologist. So the concept of a neurocardiology clinic is a good idea to navigate these complicated decisions. The first step is to assess the CA phenotype uh, and calculate the base ICH and ischemic stroke risk. If a patient had a prior lower ICH, we have excellent randomized trials, which if available, they, uh, they should take over any other uh, clinical management at this point and the patient needs to be randomized. Then you review the brain MRI imaging, ideally with susceptibility weighted sequences, which are more sensitive for siderosis and microembolism detection. You apply the Boston criteria, but really irrespective of the Boston criteria, what you need to do is to quantify the siderosis presence and severity. And then we have a couple of pathways here. If the patient has asymptomatic CA or asymptomatic microblitz, so detected incidentally, you don't need to do any further risk assessment. You need to use the best evidence approach for AF, which is uh, anticoagulation with uh, different regimens. Because again, the presence of asymptomatic microblitz should not affect the decision to anticoagulate the patient with AFib. Then, if you have a patient with multifocal siderosis or a patient who has a second lower ICH, I consider them to be at higher risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Whereas if you have a patient with no siderosis, is considered to have a lower ICH risk of hemorrhage as long as the blood pressure is very well controlled uh, at a range of uh, less than 130 over 80. Now, if you have patients with focal siderosis, they might fall between a, a, a medium ICH risk. So the best approach here is probably to use a DOAC, like a Pixaban for the lower ICH risk and maybe the medium ICH risk. And then for higher ICH risk patients with multifocal siderosis, second lobar hemorrhage, or uncontrolled hypertension, again, as Dr. Fury mentioned, another option would be an occlusion device. And again, there are so many ramifications as we have seen for the trials uh, about the, um, Peri uh, surgical uh, risk and antithrobotic management. That's why uh, the concept of a neurocardiology clinic is a very good one to approach these risks. Now, if a patient is at medium ICH risk with focal siderosis, it might be a good idea to reassess this risk by getting follow up imaging, say at six months or one year, to see if the patient's siderosis progressed to the extent of being multifocal, which then will put the patient into the higher risk group. And again, tight clinical follow-up and having a very strict blood pressure target is definitely advised across the board uh, uh, on these clinical presentations. So again, the take home message is that these patients, they really need to be randomized into clinical trials. This algorithm gives a non-evidence-based framework on how to approach these conundrums when a randomized trial is not available. And 
Again, the numbers that we go that they go into the risk and benefit assessment ratio are not accurate. Different studies have different number and the numbers. And the reality is that we don't really know the risk and benefits uh, in these patients. What we know is that siderosis is probably associated with the highest risk of future hemorrhage. So it needs to be taken into account in a way. And then uh, in, in the context of a small vessel cl disease clinic or a neurocardiology clinic, needs some careful consideration of what's the best strategy for the patient. And this strategy might change over the course of, uh, uh, of the years as you follow up this patient. Thank you so much uh, for your participation. Thank you so much, Andreas, for your very clear um, presentation. And uh, I always like your uh, use of the emoticons and I encourage everyone to follow Andreas on Twitter. It's very informative. Um, so now we will um, move on to the Q&A session. Um, I will start with a question for Dr. Uh, Shamanesh. Um, do you also prefer uh, to use a DOAC after ICH? And if yes, uh, do you prefer uh, a particular one? Um, good question. The, the difficulty in answering that question is we don't have any head-to-head -head randomized trials comparing one DOAC versus the other. So, so this answer is gonna be based on indirect comparisons that like cause how they each performed against warfarin. Um, the, the drugs that have the least risk of ICH, and if you compare them indirectly across the board, they're very similar, um, are uh, edoxaban, um, epixaban, and dibigatran. Uh, they have the least absolute rates of ICH. And with dibigatran, you also have the option of idrisuzumab uh, for reversal in most countries. Dexan and alpha is available in select countries um, for reversal of factor 10 a inhibitors. Um, but the problem with the bigger trend is that these populations is, is namely older um, and um, older patients tend to tolerate it less. And then there's GI side effects that can affect compliance. So a and doxaban are my two go-tos for this population. Great, thank you. I have, uh, so we have a lot of um, other interesting questions. Maybe another one and, uh, and uh, maybe for Andreas. Uh, so we all know uh, that uh, the modified Boston criteria have this uh, classification and of CA in possible and probable. So um, do you think this classification can help to stratify ICH risk or as uh, you showed, we, we should use uh, more a deep MRI phenotype? Yeah, excellent question. Um, I think the Boston criteria, the modified Boston criteria, can help, but only to a certain extent. In that, uh, the probable CA diagnosis is the one that is more reliable to be used in clinical practice. It's ha it has the highest sensitivity and specificity to diagnose the underlying CA, whereas the possible category, which essentially means an isolated lower hemorrhage in the absence of other hemorrhagic markers, or an isolated uh, lower microbleed, it's, it's like 50-50. 50% of the time, it, it, it might indicate CA. 50% of the time, it might not. Now, the probable CA category, there are different combinations uh, of MRI manifestations that the patient might have to make it into that category. So the probable CA category doesn't say anything about the bleeding risk. It says that the patient probably has CA with high certainty. I really believe the deep phenotyping uh, of uh, the hemorrhagic imaging manifestations of CA is what is going to tell us uh, uh, what's the actual bleeding risk within the CA category. Uh, so the presence and extent of siderosis. Now, if you have an unselected population with ICH and you apply the Boston criteria uh, to separate the big groups with uh, uh, different hemorrhagic stroke risk, then definitely the probable CA will have the highest, as you showed in the one of the slides uh, that you uh, in your introductory talk about the mix and the strictly low bar and the deep ICH. But within the CA, I think it's siderosis that confirms the high risk, irrespective of the Boston criteria classification. Totally agree. Thank you, Andreas. 
All right, so the next question is from Novella Bonafini. Um, it's for Dr. Fury. Based on which patient uh, characteristics do you choose post-procedural antithrombotic therapy and its duration after uh, left atrial appendage uh, occlusion? Great, uh, it's a wonderful question and it's not a decision that's made by the neurologist in isolation. Um, Andreas um, appropriately recommended a neurocardiology forum of some, uh, some type. We have one to review every case and in that setting, there can be discussions about the relative risk of thrombosis versus hemorrhage um, in that post-procedural period. I think it's, um, it's actually great that um, some of the observational studies have given us um, more options for the uh, various combinations of antithrombotics, given that the early trials were using a very formal prescribed pathway and, uh, and using warfarin, which is no longer uh, state of the art. Um, so there's, I can't give you absolute guidelines, um, but only say that um, it, they, it has to be personalized to the individual patient, and it should be a, a, a multidisciplinary discussion. Um, and a personal question, how often do you consult a cardiologist uh, to consider an occlusion? So we, at our my center, we do it routinely. Um, every patient who we propose um, left atrial appendage occlusion is discussed at a multidisciplinary conference. Um, and that's also an opportunity for us to talk about other neurocardiac issues like PFO closure and ILR placement. So these cases are brought to the conference by either the neurologist or the cardiologist, and then both aspects of care are discussed. And the, the team, the whole group makes a decision about the optimal um, strategy for stroke prevention. Perfect, thank you. I have another uh, interesting question for uh, uh, Andreas. Um, does your uh, algorithm can be uh, can be applied for thrombolysis decision in ischemic stroke? <laughs> Bit uh, provocative question, but I don't think so. I, I mean, this this algorithm is again purely on uh, on the on the topic of the webinar. Yeah, it's a tough question. I, I think so. First of all, in many centers, you, you don't even get MRIs before thrombolysis, so you don't really know if a patient has CA. And I do believe that patients with CA, uh, when you have uh, uh, a risk of a large territorial infarct, should benefit from uh, TPA. So all the trials of TPA, I'm sure they included patients with CA without knowing it. Uh, and uh, well, some years back, we did a meta-analysis uh, with Dr. Shomanesh as well about microbleeds in relation to the risk of, uh, uh, of uh, TPA. And uh, although the microbleeds increase the risk of uh, um, intracerebral hemorrhage post TPA, there was still benefit there. Of course, there's no head to head comparison of uh, TPA versus no TPA. And in order to have very high risk of hemorrhage, you needed to have more than 10 or 15 uh, lobar microbleeds. But again, these are observational studies. Uh, I don't think CA should be a factor in uh, decision making in, uh, in TPA in acute stroke. Thank you. I'll just maybe add the wake up trial did a subgroup analysis of patients with microbleeds at baseline. So wake up for those who don't know it was um, patients who basically were wake up, they didn't know the time of onset, uh, and then they did MRI to look at flare um, kind of ratio ratios to decide on treatment and get a surrogate of time. And in those in that study, microble patients with microbleeds did benefit, um, even those that have more severe microbleed patterns. The only limitation is there is that they very few, had very few patients with more than 10 microbleeds. Um, but uh, overall, all the data to date suggests that they still benefit. I agree entirely with Andreas's yeah. comment. Yes, so um, there were two questions about the optimal timing of starting anticoagulants after ICH. Um, and I think um, it's interesting for all of us to uh, answer that question because we uh, often uh, have this question in clinic, I think. I can maybe take a stab initially and address if you want to comment. Um, so, so the guidelines are very variable. Um, so they're anywhere kind of between four to eight weeks, typically. 
ESO and the Canadian guidelines say we just can't give a recommendation because we don't have data. In the literature, the estimates are anywhere between three days and 30 weeks. That's how broad it is. So, so the reality is, is we don't know. And there's various limitations to the data sets that suggest waiting longer. So, so um, but, but I think if you want to be by the book, guideline recommended eight weeks or four weeks. Um, I'll, I'll maybe just, I don't, we don't have time. So I'll just share a quick slide um, that you can have in the recording. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, but this is kind of my own algorithm for patients based on mechanical valves and AFib, and then based on risk of recurrent ICH and risk of thrombosis and kind of what I use uh, in my practice. Uh, again, based on a totality of very in, imperfect data. Uh, but again, guidelines typically recommend waiting longer than what I do in my practice. But, but just have it for your file or take a snapshot um, for your use. Thank you very much for sharing this. And uh, so another question on uh, CA patient and uh, hemorrhagic risk. Do, do we have any data on dual uh, antiplatelet therapy? Is it for, for CA? Maybe Andreas or Ashton, do you, do you know about? Uh... No, I, I'm not aware of any data on DAPT in terms of recurrent ICH in an ICH population. Hmm. Um, we, uh, no, but, but, but it, it, again, indirect comparisons are very imperfect. Uh, but if you were to do, because uh, there's pitfalls in populations, et cetera, across the different trials. But if you do indirect comparisons it, against aspirin, how DAPT compares versus aspirin and how NOACs have compared against aspirin, namely, um, uh, Pixaban, Averroes, uh, Dibigatrin in uh, respect ESIS, and then um, a lower dose of adoxin that's not being used um, versus nothing at all in um, the elder care AF study. Um, the, you would expect that DAPT would cause greater risks of ICH uh, than NOAX would. Okay, great. Um... So I have another question for uh, Andreas, uh, which is a personal question. So um, do you think in patients that have uh, cortical superficial siderosis and that are on a uh, DOAC, does it progress more rapidly, the superficial siderosis, like in a pathophysiological? Yeah, view? it's a very good question. So in we have done two studies on siderosis progression in CA, but we didn't have any data uh, about DOAC. So none of those patients have this data. From a few cases I have seen, I haven't particularly noted any more rapid progression, but again, you don't typically get um, MRI follow-up at regular intervals with the exact same sequence in these patients. So I, I don't really know the answer. I would imagine that in patients that have uh, focal siderosis who are on DOAC and they have a propensity to pop up new bleedings, I would imagine the DOACs will affect the hemostatic mechanism and by that way maybe lead to, uh, lead to uh, higher progression and this might explain the higher risk that we might see uh, in these patients actually but uh, I don't know the answer. And so if you had a patient with, let's say, one sulcus with superficial siderosis, would you do a follow-up with MRI? And uh, if yes, uh, in what interval? So if, if yeah, if, if you have a patient with uh, one sulcus of, uh, of siderosis uh, who uh, has AFib and is on, on, on DOAC, I, I would get a follow-up brain MRI maybe in six months or one year, just for one time to see if it really progressed within that, that time frame. And if it hasn't progressed, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not exactly sure if I would get a second one down the line, but I would be more reassured that uh, the disease progression is, uh, is very stable. So mm -hmm. it's probably uh, uh, good on their anticoagulation regimen. Of course, if there are new symptoms in these patients, because often uh, siderosis starts as a small convexal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if a patient presents with new transient focal neurological episodes, suggestive of CA or a new uh, siderosis event, then I will definitely get a um, follow-up MRI to quantify uh, the risk again. Good point, thanks. Um, I have a question for um, Professor Karen Furry. Um, 
the the majority of trial they did on um, uh, on uh, left appendage closure they did not um, enroll uh, ICH patients. So now there is only one ongoing uh, the French trial, the A3 uh, ICH, and uh, it compares. Uh, uh, so left atrial appendage closure with uh, dark apixaban and, uh, and with uh, aspirin or nothing in all type of ICH. And my question is, uh, we, we still have to wait to do uh, such type of uh, trial enrolling ICH uh, and to propose, uh, so and to evaluate left appendage closure, or if it's the time, what kind of uh, uh, trial do you think would be the most appropriate? Well, it's a, it's a wonderful question. And uh, so the, the issue is, uh, you know, you have to make decisions almost every day without the clinical trial being available. So uh, while it's, you know, ideal to wait until there is, um, you know, class A evidence, um, we probably don't have that luxury. Um, and so, you know, what would be the ideal trial? I guess an ideal trial would image everyone um, to establish their risk, as Andreas pointed out. So you could categorize patients based on the radiographic appearance and um, sort of tally up the number of lesions that suggested small vessel pathology and the, and the, the various uh, manifestations of hemorrhage. Um, and then you would also want serial imaging in addition because while patients might not be developing lobar hemorrhage in either arm, the medical versus the device, um, that doesn't mean that there might not be ongoing progression of, uh, of that pathology leading to cognitive dysfunction. And you would want a quality of life or a functional measure because it's possible that again, the weight of um, a small ischemic stroke versus an anticoagulant associated hemorrhage might have very different impact on morbidity and mortality. So I think an ideal trial would contain more of the elements that are important to vascular neurologists um, and, uh, and, and really put, put the two, uh, the two uh, treatment options on, a, on an even keel. You know, many of these trials are done by device companies and I don't mean to be um, cynical, but you know, they're, uh, they're trying to demonstrate uh, non-inferiority and efficacy of their devices. And that's not necessarily what those of us on this call are gonna prioritize. We want best quality of life, um, best long-term outcomes, whether it's events, but also cognition. Oh, wonderful comment, thank you. And maybe Ashton, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think um, I, I think the slam. I, I I think Karen did an excellent job, and I agree with everything she said. And it's a very nuanced answer. Um, in in terms of kind of comparing the current trials that are ongoing, I think A three ICH in France is very unique because you have three arms: you have aspirin, you have anticoagulation, and left atrial appendage closure as a separate arm. Um, stroke close in the Netherlands is comparing DOAC versus, and or aspirin or nothing at all any medical management versus closure in ICH patients. So the problem with the results of that trial is gonna be that you don't know what's the best medical management. So then you're gonna be comparing um, closure to a mixture of different treatments that would include nothing at all. Um, and then what the, some of us on, on this side have taken is trying to think, well, what's the feasible doing a three arm study in a rare population is hard to recruit in, or do we bite kind of take a hit on the amount of time it'll take to answer a question and go in a sequential fashion. First, answer the medical best medical management, DOAC versus no anticoagulation. And then once we've established that, then do a subsequent trial where we do closure versus whatever that best medical management ends up being. Um, so, uh, but there's a lot of factors, as you know, when you try to um, go for the best science versus the pragmatic limitations of implementing trials uh, and making them uh, successful. So. Um, but but they're, they're, uh, I think a, I think A three ICH would be the most ideal trial if there was enough patients for it. Thank you. One follow up question for Ashkan. Uh, Ashkan, can you share with us? You have this uh, international individual patient meta analysis consortium, the Cockroach. Can you that is going to pull essentially all of these data from these trials? 
Can you share with us about the prospect of having brain MRIs in some of these patients and whether some sub-analysis according to MRI manifestations of small vessel disease will be feasible? Yeah, it's a good question. So in total, once all these trials are completed, if they hit their intended sample size, we'll have 3,100 patients in this IPDMA across all these RCTs. Um, and um, a subset of them are going to be implementing MRI sub-studies. Uh, overall, I anticipate, um, I guess, uh, hopefully, that we'll have about 40% of the population with MRIs, um, and or 30 to 40%. Uh, and that would be about a thousand patients with MRIs. We don't know good data on what proportion will have siderosis, which of course is the biggest question. But in the NASPATH ICH study, which is a small Canadian pilot study we did with 30 patients, uh, 28 of which had MRI, a quarter of the population had siderosis, not just lower ICH, but in total, a quarter of fifth, rather, a fifth of the to a quarter of the population had siderosis. So you can imagine that about 250 or so patients. Uh, uh, we'll have siderosis and we could then look at a treatment interaction in that subgroup and get some suggestion uh, of where the answer lies. Thanks, yeah, very promising. Okay. So I think we answered almost all questions. Uh, so if there are no more questions, I would like to uh, close this session and uh, thank everyone for the lively discussion and thank you all for attending. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. It was really, really interesting. On behalf of the World Stroke Academy, I also would like to thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and questions. Uh, thank you everyone for joining the webinar. As mentioned before, the recorded version of it uh, will be shared with you and uploaded on the World Stroke Academy. In the meantime, make sure you follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for upcoming educational activities. Thank you again and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.